Okay, welcome to Beastly Theories. I'm your host, Andy McGrath. Uh, today we have Professor Todd Dissertel. Uh, uh, Professor Dissertel is an anthropology professor at New York University. He studies primate and human uh, evolution. He's also a molecular primatologist. He uses DNA to study the evolution of Homo sapiens and other primates. One of the stars of $10 million Bigfoot Bounty, Monster Quest, Joe Rogan Questions Everything, numerous other shows. He's been studying and specializing for 20 years in generating and testing hypotheses about primate phylogeny. His research group has, has generated many of the complete mitochondrial genomes that figure prominently in debates about phylogeny and taxonomy. Todd, how did I do with my pronunciation? You're fine on all. <laughs> Fantastic. That was yeah. a worry. How are you doing? I'm doing fine, thank you. Okay, that's great. Now, uh, this is a new show. As you know, I'm a, uh, a new cryptozoology author, specialized mainly looking at reports of um, unusual creatures in Britain. I met you at the International Cryptozoology Conference, and I was uh, immediately intrigued about your work. I'd never actually heard of it before. I don't watch a lot of TV, and, and since that time, I've seen some of your stuff and really enjoyed it. Um, I, what I would like to know, just for our guests to begin with, is how did you get started in this world of cryptozoology and its fringe affiliates. It doesn't seem to be a natural progression for a professor. As almost all things in science, uh, by accident. Um, in 1995 or 96, I came here as a brand spanking new assistant professor in 1992. Uh, three or four years later, um, the department got a cold call from actually MTV. Okay. And they were looking for a biological anthropologist for a, a mini documentary they were doing called um, Sex in the 90s. And their okay. particular episode was What He Wants. <laughs> so they had a whole bunch of people, Hugh Hefner, Snoop Dogg, John oh, Stewart. Wow a bunch of uh, real bros and other people, but they wanted a nerdy scientist to talk about, you know, primates. Um, and I was stupid enough to say yes. <laughs> and so being in New York City, sort of a media capital, um, once you get in the Rolodex, you know, you're there. And uh, I think it was just a year later, National Geographic, um, called me to look at um, hair samples from the so-called Oren Pendek um, oh, from wow. Sutra. Um, and so I sequenced those. They weren't. Wow. Okay. And, and that led to another Nat Geo show, and that segued into maybe four monster quests. And it, okay. you know, once you're in the Rolodex and... <laughs> Once you've said yes once, you know, you become the go-to person, kind that, of. And that makes sense to me. That makes to sense to me. Knowledge, there's really only three, and I don't want to uh, upset my friends and colleagues in the so-called crypto community, but I, don't, I think there's only like three actual active professors who do anything myself brian sykes and jeff meldrum okay yes I think there might be some others who have commented in the past and so on but there are very few sort of active researchers who um are, are willing to give uh this community the time of day and do you think that's because of the um the obvious downside there could be career downsides for that kind of decision or do you think it's just about maintaining the respect of your peers 
I'm, I'm not sure. I personally don't think I've had uh, a career downside. I mean, I did the first shows before I was tenured. Um, oh, wow. You know, okay. once you're tenured, you're kind of safe. <laughs> that was my next question. Yeah. <laughs> Were you tenured when you started? Uh, I, I, I catch guff from my friends and colleagues occasionally, but um, it's more or less been, I think, uh, actually a positive career experience. Um, some people in the university administration, you know, the adage, there's no such thing as bad publicity. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, this is PR. There's my name and NYU on the crawl all along the bottom of the screen. Um, so I don't think it's hurt me deep. I mean, I've gotten plenty of grants even recently. So oh, wow. Okay. Um, I mean, that, that that's interesting to, to me. I mean, uh, when you consider yourself uh, and, and what you've been involved in, it, it's quite a varied career, television career, uh, the projects that you've been involved in. Somebody like Jeff Meldrum, for instance, who's obviously taken very big steps in that direction. Do you think if you had focused in, in more of a, um, on Bigfoot, more of a pursuant kind of manner, that that would have affected you differently, perhaps? Yes, absolutely. So, I mean, the first thing I want to make clear, and I did at the conference where we met, was I do not consider myself a cryptozoologist, a squatcher, a Bigfoot researcher. Uh -huh. How can you research something that we have so little data for? Exactly. Um, so I literally don't consider myself part of that community. I consider myself a scientist whose tools can be applied to the samples and the purported data that they collect. Uh -huh. And I'm occasionally willing to work with them on some of those samples. Um, but uh, let me just big, big, big call out. <laughs> Nobody send me samples. <laughs> uh, I, I'm laughing because it's, it's, it's my next question. Do people send you samples directly? If so, what type of sample would pique your interest or what type of evidence is the most valuable to you in oh, regards to testing? I generally completely ignore that. If they <laughs> are not worked out in advance okay. through a show or through something else, I just, I ignore them. And do I they get, expect you to just go ahead and test it with yeah, your own money and on your own time? And Hundreds of dollars, thousands yeah. of dollars on samples, you know, that they found in the woods. You know, I found a bone. It must be Bigfoot. Exactly. Um, and then, you know, they're also like, and as soon as you prove this, I want my $10 million. So, uh. I mean, I get that all the time. <laughs> It's what it's I like, really love uh, about this genre, actually, is and, and what a lot of witnesses of different in this country or different alleged witnesses of cryptids find out, especially with the Loch Ness and, and things like that. Is you go to the papers and they print your story, they print your picture, they give you about 200, 250 pounds, and then next week you disappear. Yeah. Uh, the only thing you actually lose is credibility, right? Uh, with the and people so that you know. Yeah, I have to be obviously careful of that as a professional scientist. So, you know, I, I again, I'm, I, I have learned enough to, when I'm interviewed, to be very careful on what I say because I will shoot for six hours for three minutes of airtime okay. yeah. that is highly, highly, highly edited. And one, you, I don't have any say in that edit. Of you know, course. that it's owned by a production company or whatever. Um, so, you know, I want it very obvious that if they've edited me to say something that's wrong, that uh -huh. it's cut, you can clearly see I'm at a different angle, different expression, different sound, that this was not the words directly out of my mouth. And that's that's actually tricky because they're always trying to get you to say stuff. And um, a nice little soundbite, perhaps, for they're, the series. They're, you know, more or less for profit entities. You know, mm. there's NPR has never 
<laughs> National Public Radio has never interviewed me. It's always been a for-profit network. It's, it's very interesting you say that. Now, you seem to be anticipating every question I'm going to ask that comes up because of my next question was literally, you've done a lot of TV for the uninitiated. What are the pros and cons of, of adding media interpretation into this field of research? And clearly is that they need, I think that life in general, you know, when you're out there in the woods looking or you're researching things, it's kind of mundane. It's boring. It's It's drawn out. And they need to draw attention to themselves. So a couple of good that's sound bites from Todd, new classic um, Matt fun. Moneymaker, something on the hill kind of line always helps. Yeah, no, so everything, you know, you and it's even true in scientific publication. You do rocks. The, the, the most important science is rock solid, mundane, data collection, corroboration, but you will never publish the paper that said those guys who published a result two years ago look like they were right. Mm. That paper will never get published. Um, and and, and why, is, why is that? I mean, if you can explain to the audience, I've heard your perspective on science once before is about not proving things more than proving them. Right. Or uh, uh, eliminating things from the list of and you'll notice suspects. You'll notice how I said that. I didn't say they were right. I said that they were supported. Um, and so I always have to be careful, too, yeah. about that. I don't know if you saw the very recent paper that was published about the new species. Well, it's a several-year-old species, Australopithecus sediba, um, which... Um, my one of my colleagues here in this department was one of the co-authors on and they are strongly suggesting that you know their hypothesis is that this is the closest australopithecine to the genus homo okay. the press scientists confirm missing link uh, oh and in fact i saw that headline very recently and, yes. yeah, like yesterday or day before and yeah. one there's no missing link and two we never confirm anything in science <laughs> we support we corroborate we don't refute mm -hmm. but we don't confirm and so that headline to me the confirm is actually as annoying as the missing link quote uh -huh. words which there's no such thing as well uh -huh. Uh -huh. i think it's it's interesting now personally in my professional life i've worked in the medical field for uh, eight years and uh, a lot of my colleagues were into research and developing new medical technologies and they pointed out the same thing when it breaks on the news that we will be able to do so and so in x amount of years Never. <laughs> they mean we've started the research. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. what we're doing right now. We've the human the genome project. is going to cure everything, right? Yes, of course. Yeah. Stem cells, <laughs> everything. Cures everything. We'll live forever. Yeah. Um, hopefully soon. Um, just very quickly, now, I, in regards to, to things like Bigfoot, and you've obviously been asked about this a lot, most people think it's a primate, or many people do, and the Gigantopithecus theory comes in a lot. Yeah. Um, I'm assuming you think it's some kind of primate, or you're assuming it might be. Um, do you think it's possible for a primate of that size or lead size to remain undiscovered in the world at this point of time? It's possible, but unlikely. And so one of my favorite quotes is, you know, the probability, it's not zero, mm -hmm. but it's pretty adjacent to it. And there, there are multiple good reasons. So another area of my research is um, conservation genetics. Uh -huh. so part of my lab's work is actually identifying, we've actually identified new species and subspecies of primates. In wow. fact, I have a paper with my colleagues coming out later this month and with two new species in it. Um, wow. And so, and in fact, they are ironically what we would call cryptid species because oh, wow. you can't really tell them apart, but they don't mate with each other. They, okay. they 
make their calls. They're slightly different. And genetically, they're extremely different from each other. Oh, so wow. if you just had the two guys sitting in front of you, you wouldn't know that they were different species. And so in biology, we call those cryptid species. Uh -huh. These are small nocturnal primates. Um, and so, in fact, I am a cryptozoologist. <laughs> I, I am in, in the true sense of the word. In the true sense. Yeah, in the true sense of the word. cryptid species for which there is bona fide biological evidence for them. Um, I, I think that's quite a, amazing, really. And I, um, well, I was going to ask you if there were any truly new species of primates that have been discovered in our, our modern era, and obviously those are them. Now, I'm assuming they, as you say, they look similar to another uh, species that's in existence. But uh, by cryptid species, you mean that it's their uh, physiological, we, biological well, characteristics are undiscovered? Well, they're they're visual. We can't tell them apart. Uh -huh. They can tell each other apart because they won't mate with each other. But uh -huh. we, can. but there have been actual new species. So uh, a new species of Gwenin monkey. These are these really cute, colorful, arboreal monkeys in Africa. Um, all of the genetic work for an, an actual new species called Cer Cercopithecus lomamiensis was actually wow. done in my laboratory. That's um, amazing subspecies of chimpanzees and gorillas where um, our genetic work helped us define them as new things. And we got to remember when we say new, I mean, the local natives, they knew mm -hmm. what that monkey was. They tasted really good. You know, <laughs> they had their own local name for it. But in, you know, in, in the sort of unknown to, and I hate this term, Western science, mm. um, you know, I mean, the gorilla was like that until... Of course, the 1850s, 1860s. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, no, there are new species out there, you know, and 99.9% .9 of them are bacteria. But every now and then we do find new mammals. And it's usually not something completely unknown. It's, uh -huh. oh, this population is so genetically distinct from all the yeah. others that it indeed should be elevated from say a subspecies or even just a population to a new species. I so understand. there's very few absolutely new new things except this Cercopithecus lumamiensis is pretty new. It was not known to Western researchers wow. and it's in the deepest, deepest Congo and hard to get to. And it's only in the last few years that samples of it and pictures and stuff have gotten out. The, the chimpanzee and gorilla subspecies were populations that we didn't realize could be elevated to the level of a subspecies. So mm -hmm. they were known, we just didn't know that they were important, if you will. I understand. And I, I've heard people refer to species like that before, or the species like the gorilla before it was discovered, as, um, but it's known locally as ethno-known species. Yeah. So would you personally know of, of many ethno-known species of apes uh, around the world, uh, primates? The orang pendek, for example, would you say that's I mean, ethno-known or does that still the, strain to the... I can uh, list yeah. the orang pendek, the almas, uh -huh. the... Yeti, Sasquatch, okay. all those, you know, but ethno in which sense? <laughs> yeah, so, so by, by local populations. That's, that's yeah, what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Part of the problem is every culture that I know of has local mythologies, local stories, etc. And when we come in or cryptozoologists come in and like, oh, Loch Ness, it's, they, look, we can show you medieval bestuaries with dragons, that's Loch Ness. Or there's Native American myths about something out in the forest, oh, that's Bigfoot or Sasquatch. Uh -huh. But most of those connections, I think, are spurious, you know, uh -huh. those are people 
you, you can find, I mean, vampires, werewolves, I mean, all well, this of is, Yeah, this is something that I've, I've uh, come to recently. Now, clearly, many of the things in my own book would had to be based upon um, eyewitness reports, anecdotal yeah. evidence. And I point out in the book, this is not a work of academia. In that this is, we're taking history here almost. It might be modern history. Yeah. Uh, but they're reports. It's it's what people are telling us. There is no scientific evidence to back it up. And it's not essentially a science, you know, at, at this point. Um, one of the things uh, I found very interesting when I uh, first met you and realized who you were, you were walking over to me, uh, to my table. I had a little table there. While I was waiting to speak and selling some books and things. You bought a book. And um, I remember thinking, and it's a very funny thought, oh, gosh, no. Todd's walking towards me. Andy, do you really know your position well enough to debate with this man? <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, well, quick, think about what, what's your position on this? What's your position on that? And you just came and very politely had a chat and bought the work and walked away. Uh, real anticlimax. <laughs> you signed up for me, so. <laughs> You're just being a nice guy and saying hello and it's fine. But it, it got me thinking, really, that uh, the work that you do and the true need to solicit the interest of uh, other academic heads to work in uh, towards discovering this field. And so, um, I wanted to know if you thought there was a thawing in opposition to this field of research and conventional sciences, or, or do you think it'll always be on the fringe? I mean, until there's some data for any of the things, mm -hmm. it's, I think it will be fringe, but it's a fascinating and interesting fringe. I myself, I mean, my probable retirement project, we're talking 15 years from now, um, I really want to write a book in which I bring in ethnologists, folklorists, linguists, psychologists, sociocultural anthropologists and others to try to see, and I, we won't answer the question, but to lay out why every culture has mm. myths and monsters and at the risk of offending some people, you know, every culture also has religion. Mm -hmm. from, from my perspective, there is an equivalent amount of evidence <laughs> for the supernatural. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's a human universal. Yeah. And so, you know, it's either, you know, from a book and this is your god or gods, or it's a myth of a creature out in the woods. Mm -hmm. But I can't think of any single human culture that doesn't have some supernatural stories, etc. And mm -hmm. I very intrigued by that. I mean, some of them are, you know, explainable, um, but, you know, many are not. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, in this day and age of just ubiquitous, all these memes and story, memes not in your quickie internet. Yeah, no sure. Real sense of a meme. <laughs> um, they spread far and wide. They do. And, they you know, they do. So, you know, the stuff about Bigfoot or Sasquatch and Loch Ness, most of those can actually be traced back to 20th century things, you know, and and then people have made more ancient connections, but they are explicable. Um, I don't know if you have seen, um, oh my God, I'm going to, blank on the book, but Daniel Prothero and um, Daniel Loxton's book, um, it'll come to me in a minute. Mm -hmm. um, they go through a whole bunch of creatures and look at the evidence, or Ben Radford's work on Chupacabra. I saw, um, no, I saw Ben Radford's work on Champ. I read his piece on Champ. Uh, he was meant to be speaking, I think. In fact, uh, he was supposed to be at the same event that we were speaking at, I believe. But... Um, um, you know, so, I mean, one story is that basically Loch Ness is based on the plesiosaur in King Kong. 
you know, yes, there was a, a, a yeah. newspaper store. It wasn't until after King Kong was in theaters, all of a sudden, uh-huh. the stories. But then again, people have now tried to take those back further to unexplained thing to medieval things. Big oh. fit for all intents and purposes and um I, I would have to go back and reread the book, but I think it was 1955 when uh, this bulldozer operator first planted the fake footprints and got news coverage in the, uh, the summer news cycle, and it basically started there. Uh, Chupacabra, if I recall correctly, it's from the 60s. Um, again, people try to... I mean, that one, at least, there seems to be several representations of it. This but people problem. try to tie it to Aztec and Mayan uh-huh. and stuff. But of course, there's monsters in every culture, and you know, just because the Mayans talked about something that killed cattle, doesn't make it the chupacabra. Exactly. Lots of things killed cattle. I mean, it, it's interesting to me now here um, in the UK. I suppose we would. Uh, historically, if you wanted to look back, we would try to equate Bigfoot with the Woodwows or the Green Man or something like that. And there were enough medieval tapestries and carvings on churches of large hairy men yeah. carrying clubs yeah. to justify that. But also having studied religion for my degree, I know that um, that that's a, a, a Celtic or a, a Teuton representation also of Janus, the god Janus. Okay. Holds the club. Scott, okay. Yeah, so it, it's actually one of the um, primary sort of pantheon gods that's passed through all the different cultures and comes into the UK as well. So yes, it could be hairy wood, uh, wood woes or uh, Bigfoot of some kind, but it's also got that classic Janus club in the hand every single time. So for me, when I see that, I say, okay, that's that's some sort of evidence, perhaps, but it's also very folkloric, and I know the religious background to it. Mm-hmm. So I try to exclude that. Um, one of the things that troubles me at the moment, I think, in the Bigfoot genre or community is it's popular, and there seems to be a lot more uh, photographic and film evidence out there than there could possibly be for a, a tiny species clinging on to survival here in certain parts of the world. What are your thoughts about the different types of um, non-scientific evidence that comes up with the photographs, the footprints? I've heard you talk about this once before. You said that footprints can't be evidence, but I always wondered about, well, what about footprints that somebody like Cliff or Jeff Witcher with dermal ridges and all these different details inside? Well, what else could they possibly be? Well, so... Again, at the risk of offending some friends, I typically, I would divide the, again, I, I'm loath to use the term Bigfoot research community. Uh-huh. <laughs> Let's say the Bigfoot enthusiast community. I think that's a good description. Yeah. Into three-thirds. Well, obviously, it has to be three-thirds, right? <laughs> um, there are the outright hoaxers. Uh-huh. There's way too many of them. Mm -hmm. Then in the middle, I would say, are the hucksters. Like, oh, there was a Bigfoot sighting in our area. I'm going to open the Bigfoot Cafe, the Bigfoot Motel. I'm going to print T-shirts. I'm going to make money off this phenomenon. I don't care if it's real or not. I'm going to make money. I didn't fake it. I didn't do it myself, but Mm -hmm. I'm going to take advantage of it. So sure. that's what I call the hucksters. Okay. And then there are the people I and the ones I like the most are the the true enthusiasts who are really trying. And they could be total amateurs at it. Mm-hmm. Like we're going squatching this weekend. Let's grab our cameras and our tents and mm-hmm. go out in the woods for two days. And then there are the really serious guys like the Olympic Project and others where, you know, camera traps and really serious attempts at the research, mm-hmm. um, trying to collect valid biological samples that aren't contaminated, et cetera. And so those guys I'm far more willing to give the time of day to mm-hmm. than, you know, the hoaxers I don't want to have anything to do with. They're, no, they're of course not. And the hucksters, 
uh, hey, I buy their stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I was going to say, they're essentially <laughs> businessmen looking for an avenue, aren't they? Right. Businessmen yeah, and women say, this matter. looks popular. I guess I could sell some coffee right. or mugs or T-shirts or tours or whatever's going yeah. on. Necklaces or necklaces. I've got a few bits and pieces. <laughs> <laughs> um, I got chammy. Well, you name it, I got it. <laughs> um, but it, it's the uh, and like the just the fans or the enthusiasts. I I never try to talk down to them. No. Um, I you know hey if if something makes you excited and gets you out in the woods, <laughs> why would I stop you? Yeah. Um, but it, it, it's the, the true believers. And here's where the problem, yeah. the problem falls for me as a scientist. Um, if you're literally trying to prove something, that's not part of the scientific method anymore. <laughs> if like, I'm going to go find evidence of Bigfoot or I'm going to go prove Bigfoot exists, mm -hmm. You have lost that skeptical nature of properly evaluating and fairly evaluating the data and thinking about what's the alternative explanation for what I just think I witnessed. So that's um, like an everything but Bigfoot first, right? Yeah, it's so like everything you look at must be something else before you consider that to be objective. Yeah, it's not my, I forget, I got to look up who said the quote, you know, if you hear hoof beats, don't turn around and look for a zebra. Unless you're in the Serengeti, then, uh -huh. it be a, you know, but if I'm on the streets of New York, yes. and I hear hoof yeah. beats, probably a horse, I'm guessing, <laughs> you know, just uh, the prior probability is pretty high. The Bayesian probability is pretty high that I'm hearing a horse behind me, Yeah, you know. Yeah. And but the big footers, squatchers, it's like I saw a shadow. Mm -hmm. Oh, it was Bigfoot. I got this big footprint. It couldn't be a double bear strike. Uh -huh. It could be somebody trying to fool me. It must be Bigfoot. Um, I got a film or a blurry photo <laughs> or Oh, that has to be Bigfoot. You know, everything that moves in the woods is not Bigfoot. And I can tell you this. I just spent a good part of October November, and November deer hunting at my property upstate. A lot of things move in the woods. And I did not well, see Bigfoot. Except at the foot of my driveway where I have a Bigfoot and a Yeti's <laughs> <laughs> at the foot of my driveway at my cabin upstate New York. But you already knew they were there to begin with. And I think, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, the funny thing about it, so I was recently at Loch Ness in Scotland. There was mm -hmm. a sighting, so I went up to investigate uh, early January. And there's the Great Glen Highway runs across the top of the hills and forests. It's really beautiful. There's a, a walk. It's about six, seven hundred feet elevation. You, know, you just walk up this path. It's beautiful. There was nobody around. So I went walking up there one cold morning by myself. I was up there for four hours. Didn't hear a single sound. Deep, high pine trees. Didn't see a bird, nothing. And I, I get to the top, I look at the, the lock, it's beautiful. I start to come back down again. There were a few felled trees. And I made a little funny video about it saying, you know, if a tree falls in the wood, dig Bigfoot, uh, mm -hmm. push it down. Yeah. Um, and no, of course not, you know, it, it gets windy and and uh, everything, uh, everything in the woods falls naturally and well, makes some I, kind of. As I say, whenever my friends or others send me, look, here's a stick structure. I'm like, well, and there's also this 14 and a half billion year old phenomenon called gravity. Yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Trees fall. <laughs> But not only that, um, how about bushcrafting? So I see lots of pictures uh, here in the UK of um, of sticklings and little X's. And I've been out in the woods at night and I've seen strange X's together and I even saw a little pinned arch that was held up. People bushcraft and in that same forest, about two acres away, there were some perfectly made bushcraft shelters. 
Mm-hmm. So, and even the person I was with said to me, well, you know, maybe the shelters are something else. Um, just before we finish up, Todd, and I do really appreciate that you've uh, spent the time with us today. Do you have any future products, uh, projects going on? Can we find you anywhere specific? How can people support the work that you're doing? Well, I'm, I mean, my research is funded, et cetera. Um, one of the things I am working, I got a couple agreements with various producers and production companies. I'm very excited about environmental DNA. Okay. So, the, you know, so again, if I take, a, and somebody is doing this at the moment in Loch Ness, a British Professor team. Gemmel. Yeah, you know, collecting yeah. water, and if you sequence every single little fragment of DNA in that water, uh-huh. if there is an unknown thing there, it will be found. Wow. Um, the same thing for dirt and soil and other things. So um, that's one of my new pushes, but it's not to look for Bigfoot or Loch Ness. It's to do uh, biodiversity surveys of really critically important things for primates. Fantastic. That really is amazing. Um, I definitely have to keep us abreast of all of that research as it goes on. Thank you so much for coming on. I'm sorry, once again? We can do an update once we get some more environmental DNA. That would be fantastic as well. Todd, thank you so much. And I'll I'll be posting this for the 1st of Feb. And um, you've been a great guest. Thanks for coming on. Thank you very much. Take care.